have Nicholas and my alcoholic. Um, oh, thanks, Caleb. Um, so I'm going to try, obviously, just break this up and, and get this out right. Um, um, yeah, I think I have no better place than to start from the beginning. Um, and I grew up in a in a home with two continental parents, a uh, Greek mom, Italian, a uh, Greek dad, Italian mom, and um, very, very loving, very affectionate home, pretty normal, middle class home, um, lots and lots of love, had an older brother, or have an older brother, um, yeah, from a very, very young age, as cliche as it sounds, um, I knew there was something, something wrong, you know, I didn't feel like I belonged. Um, I was very close to my older brother until we went to school. He's two years older than me. Uh, from then on, I remember sitting with my mom cooking and baking in the kitchen because she was an old, you know, Italian auntie sitting in the kitchen all day. That's how it was back then. And um, getting to school my first day, it's the one memory I have that will never leave me. Um, just being so excited to see uh, Tito. I used to call him Tito, my older brother. I couldn't say his name properly because I had a lisp, which I still have a little bit of. Um, I ran up to him at break when I found him and I ran up to him and tried to hug him because it was just my, you know, he was my everything. And he pushed me away um, as if to say, like, who are you? Get away from me. Um, and that was my first taste of rejection, um, which stuck for me and, and, and I held it against him. I didn't realize how much until I actually came into recovery and worked through my steps, how I harbored these resentments. Um, my whole life. Um, anyway, oh, that was my first taste of it. Growing up was pretty normal. Um, you know, school, my brother was very nerdy, hung around with all the girls, so I got teased a lot that my brother was this gay boy, and, uh, and I didn't like that, and I didn't want to be like that. So I quickly moved away over to like the cooler kids, tried to fit in there, played sports, did well at that. I excelled academically too. Um, still didn't feel like I fitted in anywhere, you know. Um, my little brother came along, the light lamaki. Um, I uh, swore I'd never be like him, like my older brother was to me, and, and I held him very close to me, um, very protective over him, still am. Um, and uh, yeah, just getting, getting through. I remember 12 years old, started school a bit early. Um, I had to change schools. Going to Standard 5, Grade 7, I think it is. Um, my little brother was starting his Grade 1 year, and my mom wanted me with him, and we had moved to a different area. So they wanted me to go to the same school with him to, to be there for him, which I took pride in because I knew I wasn't going to be that person that pushed him away, you know, and I'd be there for him. Um, my first taste of alcohol was that December holiday. Uh, and this is... Uh, I Quickly the insanity started for me and how quickly the madness was, you know, like I never even, I don't think we went through this in, 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 uh, in treatment because I didn't even remember, like everything started coming back to me now. Um, yeah, we went to the Vol Dam. I'm from Joburg, so we went to the Vol Dam. A uh, mate of mine that I played soccer with that was in school with me, he was also a light lamaki and his older brother and sister were much older. So we went with the sister and the husband and their friends and they were all at the dam and drinking and hunting on and we were water skiing and so ah, we obviously part, partook in all of this and we, I had my first taste of, I think it was, I don't know, Captain Morgan, it was a rum, oh my god, worst experience of my life, I hated it. Uh, consequences came immediately, I had a skiing accident, broke my knee in two places, tore all the ligaments. I got in the boat, I told them I think I broke my leg, and they laughed at me, and they're like, ah, oh, don't be stupid, you know, if you broke your leg, you'll be crying. So I hopped around the, the Vol Dam for the next day and a half. Thank God we went home the next day. I got to my mom, well, my mom came to fetch me, and I said, mom, I think my leg's broken. Um, I was sore, please take me to the doctor. They eventually rushed me in to the emergency, and they, they operated, and they put two screws through my knee. And that was the first time I ever had my drug of choice coming out of post-op, um, which was pethidine, which Caleb said. Uh, obviously, didn't know what it was, but yeah, um, using it later growing up, that feeling came back and it triggered, and you know, that was, that was my flavor. That was what, what took me down in the end. 
Um, yeah, I hated alcohol after that. It was, oh, it was horrid. Got to school the next year, um, could re reinvent myself. No one knew me. And this is now where I can relate to me being an addict, you know, these masks that I wore. Um, came into school with this, I don't know, this, I don't know, contraption thing, this brace that they put on my leg. It looked like it came out of a space movie back in the early 90s. Um, and I walked into the school very fearful because all my experience was, you know, you the, the Morphe's brother. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was taken in and I made friends and, and I quickly became very popular and very cool, you know. Um, my little brother came in and I protected him. Uh, we, he hung around with us and we, we made sure that he was looked after. Um, at this stage of my life, my father was having an affair. Uh, he bought a pub, uh, was sleeping with one of his bartenders. My mom caught him out. Uh, my bedroom was right by their bedroom, so I heard all the arguments in the evening. I was the only kid that knew what was going on in the family. Um, yeah, so through the year, um, obviously I knew there was uneasiness, uncertainty at home. I still carried on, you know, school, I was the cool kid. Um, girls w became an issue because I started getting attention from them, and then I would give attention. I, um, it just it was, it was a nightmare from, from day one. I mean, I just was always in trouble, always, always getting jacked or caned at school. Um, through the year, started smoking, standard five, second taste of alcohol, uh, December holidays again. Went to a disco, you know, everyone turned 13, so we went to the school disco, and myself and two mates bought a bottle of brandy, and the three of us drank this bottle of brandy in about 3.2 minutes. Uh, anymore, and she's like, "You smoke too," and I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." So, um, yeah, my mates went to hospital, had their stomachs pumped. My parents thought it was a good idea to take me home and let me feel the pain, which uh, again didn't help. You know, I vomited for three days solid. Insanity is, you know, um, you know, doing the same thing over, expecting a different result. Uh, getting to high school again, same thing. Went to the same high school, got the same sort of label. And again, wanted to fit in. So um, I would start standing up for my older brother and a lot of fighting and always in trouble and, and always on daily reports and just, just the insanity. You know, I made friends with a few guys in my trick because they obviously saw the way I was and, and they related to me and started, got introduced to one of the first drugs of my choice when I was 14. Um, I was 13, turning 14. I started school a bit early. And uh, by the time I was 14, uh, we were going out into fields and tripping for days and doing all of that type of stuff, and it was, it was amazing. Uh, I finally found like I belonged and like, uh, like I had arrived, you know, like my life felt purposeful. Um, my parents had announced that they were getting divorced, and uh, my mom turned, well, obviously always was a full-blown alcoholic, never drank growing up, started drinking, started taking sleeping meds. Um, we'd come home at night, and because um, I, I had a big soccer career, so I left that out, which I obviously ended off through my knee breaking. Um, my dad was always with me at soccer, and my mom came home one night and uh, obviously found out stuff, shenanigans about my, my dad and one of the soccer moms, um, and came to my room and started hitting me and telling me that it was all my fault. Um, and that you wish that I was never born. I'll never forget that either, one of the very few memories. I hold that against her and I hated her most of my life um, for that. Um, yeah, and that, that, those, those things, you know, my mom and my brother hold so close to me and I just really throve on that, that anger to them and blamed everything I ever did. It's one of my biggest defects of character, uh, blaming, not taking responsibility. Um, and yeah, I let that drive me for, for, for a very long time. Um, school was never good. My brother became head boy, uh, standard eight. I was obviously the cool kid still. Uh, never at school, always out in the jaw at raves, um, getting high at school, doing everything that I shouldn't be doing, the full rebellion vibe. Uh, my brother called me out one day at break by the tuck shop and um, embarrassed me, and I, and I hit him. 
and I uh, got taken to the office and they wanted to expel me and I just wanted a way out of school and they couldn't back then there was a law you had to be 16 or have a standard 8 anyway long story short um, they wanted me out I wanted to get out uh, we landed up working away around it I knew someone that uh, had a friend that was a hairstylist and uh, uh, they said that they would take me on as an apprentice and write a letter for me saying that they would take, send me to college as soon as I was 16. And it was not what I wanted to do. Um, funny now how things work out though because it's my biggest passion in life. Um, and it was a way out of school. It was a get out of free school card for me. And I took it with both arms open. Um, I'll never forget my first interview that I went for. The guy said to me, you know, there's my BMW, my house is down the road here in Woodmead in Santon. He said, these Santon mommies, they, they're awesome, bring a condom in your wallet, and, you know, and that was me set. He said the right things to me, and I was in. Not thinking about my future, not thinking about what was right for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I dove straight into that head first. Um, my dad disowned me. He said to me that, it, uh, he said, but this is not right, this is not a real job. Um, told me that if I leave school that I'm out of the house and that he won't support me. And uh, me being the person that I was, um, I gave him the finger and I walked away at 15. Um, I then started dealing drugs to support myself, um, obviously being very involved with a lot, a lot of older guys and being out on the door with them. It was money, it was easy money. Um, hairdressing took the back seat, it always had the back seat, it was always just a, a cover up. Um, and uh, I had moments of clarity through doing it where I, I became pretty passionate and I found, I found like a zest for it and um, I had a girlfriend that I had with me that I just treated like absolute trash and would always mess around and um, always back and forth and in and out and, and uh, just really if I look at the turmoil and the destruction that I, and the havoc that I read back then, um, I don't know how I got through those years. Um, the consequences came quick again, you know. Uh, started, got arrested the first time when I was 16 or 17. Um, managed to pay our way out of it. Um, through to 18 to 20, um, things got bigger, you know. I thought I was this gangster. Um, little did I know when I still, I still thought I was like it until I came into treatment. <laughs> And I got told gangsters don't come to rehab. Gangsters are out there being gangsters. And um, yeah, that stuck with me. It <laughs> always will stick with me. And, it, and I'm grateful for it because I realize now that I was always just a scared little boy trying to, trying to find sort of fear, trying to fight people with fear and trying to install fear into people. Um, and it's not who I am at all. Um, I'm getting to know myself now and I'm still far from ever discovering it, but, uh, but I'm willing now, you know. Before I became willing, the chaos and the insanity that came along in my life was, was insane. Um, I'm not going to hop on too much about all the war stories and all of that stuff. Um, I just want to like, make a few clear points of the insanity. Um, I very quickly, age of 22, decided that uh, hairdressing wasn't for me anymore, that I was too busy um, being this drug kingpin that I thought I was. And I stopped and I retired at the age of 22, thinking that uh, I had life waxed, you know. I was making a lot of money, um, got involved with all the wrong people. And, uh, yeah, then, then the turmoil really started and my life really took a turn. Um, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Uh, all the people that uh, I got involved with were really hectic people. Um, and I did really stupid things, and I, and I, and I, and you know, I, I'm just glad I got through it. Um, I eventually landed up on the drug of my choice, um, full on, by the age of 23, because the stress of my lifestyle was too much, and you know, all the uppers that I was doing were too hectic, and I needed to calm down. So it was a great idea to start mainlining pethidine, um, which uh, I thought was amazing. And, you know, obviously in my, the splendor of all my arrogance, um, it was at the time. Consequences came quick. Uh, the madness that then followed, um, arrest after arrest. My house had been raided time after time again. Uh, 
court cases started spiraling. By the time I was 25, um, I had five pending cases and one conviction for illegal firearms, um, and they re-arrested me again. I'd fallen asleep outside uh, in a parking lot in Norwood, and I had a whole lot of drugs and paraphernalia around me, and the police were outside by my window, and eventually my lawyers were just like, but you need, you need help. And uh, they put me into the section 22'd me. Uh, I was in prison, they didn't give me any bail. So they court ordered me, they gave me an option to either stay in prison or to go to a rehab facility in the Northern Cape, um, which I took. I got to this rehab facility and after three days of being there, told them to take me back to prison. Um, it was the worst, <laughs> oh, the, that place is worse in prison, I, I don't recommend it to anybody. Um, they agreed and they said, okay, cool. And then about a day later, I was like, listen, but have you phoned my lawyers? I need to go back to prison. And uh, he said, John, oh, come with me, let's phone them. So he walked me upstairs and walked me into a room. And as I went into the room, walked out and locked the door and threw a Bible at me and said, you will fucking pray and you will... You will be here. This is where you're at. You don't have a choice. You've lost your rights. And um, I complied and, uh, you know, I had a huge resentment against God. I told them all I wasn't Christian. They locked me. They kept me there longer. They told me that I could come out when I believed. Uh, so, yeah, I started trying to, like, I praised God and I did this whole fake persona. Got out three days later. I found a little partner in crime and we decided we were going to run away. We broke a window of this rehab facility and we bolted and they caught us on the train tracks about 50 kilometers out. They came with buckies looking for us. And these guys, oh, they meant business. Uh, they found us, went back. Anyway, I got drilled um, pretty hard. Um, eventually just sat it out and thought, well, this is it. I've got to just be here. Um, started growing veins, you know, because at that stage already, um, I'd collapsed all the veins in my arms. My legs were pretty sat already. Um, and uh, I would start seeing stuff growing back and then every day would have a different relapse vein. Got out and did exactly what I wanted to do. Carried on, uh, got back into my gangster life. Uh, at this point, all the guys I was involved with didn't want to know me because of I was a junkie. They, they weren't junkies, they were, they were different, you know, they, they believed they needed to make money out of this thing and, and it was different for me. Um, and I tried and I tried and I tried and then from then the consequences just kept coming. Eh? Um, I got deep vein thrombosis at the age of 26, 27 nearly. Um, couldn't walk, my legs were like this. And I landed up in the Joburg Gen, another consequence. Um, couldn't walk. No medical aid, no job, nothing. Uh, just a glorified wannabe drug dealer. And uh, yeah, I, I was in a wheelchair, um, couldn't walk at all. And um, eventually after a month and a half of being in there, they asked me to leave because they caught me following the nurse around administering meds, um, trying to steal her morphine and pethidine ampules out of the trolley because I was, I'm a junkie, that's what I do. Um, so I got asked to leave, they RHT'd me, um, didn't know what that meant back then, learnt it now recently, um, and yeah, again, insanity, yeah, you know, I've written off many cars, passed out driving, um, never my own, until towards the end, um, and didn't care, you know, just hurt everyone and everything in, that came my way, uh, I eventually got arrested, and was refused bail. Um, the investigating officers that were on our case had, they finally got us, you know, they finally got me with everything they wanted to get me with and I got promised uh, two life sentences. Uh, there were seven of us involved. Um, we were in prison. Uh, I can't even count how many times I've been in jails and holding cells. I've been to prison three times. This was my longest stint in, in a prison. Uh, I think plus minus 11 months. Um, we eventually got bail. But in prison, again, insanity, you know. You get caught for doing these things, but what we're doing, we're paying wardens to go out and meet people and we're bringing drugs into prison. 
the madness, just the, the madness. It was never my fault. It was always everyone else's, you know. I could never connect to, 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 to all of this thing like that, that like, and, and actually see my part in any of this. It was always circumstance. Ah, oh, but the police came at the wrong time, you know. It was never like, but fuck, what are you doing, bud? Like, look at you. I could never see that. I could always, I could, I always thought that I was doing the right thing, and that was what I, I was meant to be doing. And I was, I was cooked, absolutely cooked, my whole life. The madness that, that 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 came from it all was just insane. Anyway, long story short, I came out of prison. I found out I had a daughter uh, of 18 months. I got given the opportunity to meet her if I cleaned up. I was living with my dad at that point, stealing his microwaves, becoming a real junkie demanding money from him because I felt entitled to because through the years I'd helped him out um, and hold that like a knife to his throat. Um, the poor old man, I put him through absolute hell. I've, I've made him drive me to Hillbrow once to go score because I was so sick and I was vomiting everywhere because the drug of my choice did that to me. Um, it's just turmoil, eh? absolute turmoil. Um, when I found out I had this little girl, Megan, I thought, this is it, you know, like, and then I, again, it was, God, why, why have you done this to me now after I've ruined my life and I'm going to prison, you know, why, why have you, why have you done this? Um, and it was always a big toffee to the man upstairs or to whatever your guy's higher power is or my higher power. Um, I still battle with that for me. I just keep it simple. Um, and, uh, yeah, I got to meet her. Um, we landed up getting back together or together. Um, and she somehow convinced me to move to Durban, to Unkomos, actually, Wydenham, down the road, yeah. um, because that was going to fix me, you know. Um, she didn't realize that wherever she took me, she was taking me with her. Um, and, uh, yeah, we did that. And I would have to fly back and forth to Joburg for my court cases every month. And every month I would relapse there and I would use, um, you know, a, and she would, I'd come back and she would be shattered. And why, why are you choosing the drugs over, over me and all of this nonsense? And, and I could never answer. Um, I could never, ever answer. You know, coming here, um, that's when my alcohol, my drinking started, um, you know, because I substituted. I'm a junkie, that's what I do. Um, if I can't have one, I'll have the other. And um, I did that. I, I just drank myself into oblivion yeah, with her. She's also an addict or an alcoholic. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, turmoil. Uh, eventually, after f four years of doing that and this court case going on and me resenting God, thinking that this is the end for me, um, money ran out because obviously all the guys I was involved with were also just as messed up as me couldn't pay lawyer's bills. Eventually, we get a phone call, um, and the guy whose house was in his name, it was his house, and the car that where they found all the paraphernalia was in his name. They found him face first in the bath. Um, he OD'd and fell asleep face first in the bath, and he died. Um, and uh, they then investigated that and saw that it was, his COD was that. Um, and the case fell apart. And again, I blame God. I was like, why am I free now after losing? Because my ex had left me at that point. She had relocated back to Joburg and taken the kids away from me and put restraining orders against me because, you know, on booze and all of that, I'm a monster. I'm an animal. I broke her nose. I've, I've done terrible things to people um, under the influence. Sorry, I'm jumping a lot. I'm just trying to get through all of that so that it's done. Um, um, and yeah, and that's where my, my real self-pity and woe is me moments really hit in. Um, and my resentments really got big. I resented her, my mom, my brother, God, all the authorities. Because, you know, screw them for finding me. Why can't they go get the real murderers? All I was doing was distributing quality narcotics to people. I wasn't harming anybody. That was my thinking. Um, you laugh, but that, that was my thinking. That was, you know, where I was at. Um, so my career then started again, yeah? It was the one good thing that came out of my relationship when we did come here. Yeah? I stopped doing all of that. 
um, when I found out about my daughter, I became very fearful. I thought one day, what happens if she takes drugs that I've put on the street? Um, and then the pennies dropped a little bit, so I'm backtracking again, but just to fill you in. And uh, I started working out for a company in Umslanga, a uh, very good company, um, and I got career driven. I channeled my energy and all my anger into work. Um, I'd go to work, come back from work, or not even come back from work, go straight down to the Umslanga village, and my door would start. Eh? I would draw so freaking hard. The morning would come, the sun would, the birds would start tweeting, and I'd go home, shower, get to work, and it was eat, sleep, brave, repeat for pretty much from 2011 till the day I walked into Cedars last year. Um, yeah, a lot of things happened. Uh, I started becoming quite successful, so my ego was good. You know, it was like, ah, oh, I've beat this thing, I'm off the needle. I'm just uh, jawling and drinking and, and just, you know, using, obviously, recreationally, and which was like every second day, um, or every day, because I could really keep my eyeballs open after off, off work, after a few beers, you know, obviously a few bags sound like a great idea, and that's what would happen. Um, and it was amazing, you know, uh, the affirmation and the grandiosity and the job and all of my defects were just rearing, and I was just going and feeding into this, this, this ego and um, I got given an opportunity with an ex-girlfriend of mine to open a business. I grabbed her with open hands, the insanity, madness, going to an ex-girlfriend with her new boyfriend to open a business because they had bought the business and weren't getting it right. And then she pulled me in, uh, obviously knowing she could manipulate me because of the way I was. And I was just fed straight into it. Uh, and... Uh, and yeah, it was amazing. I got my own branding, my own name on this business. And that was me, eh? Life was amazing. Um, seven months later, got into a big hoo-ha, um, egos flaring. And uh, yeah, I walked out the afternoon and, and uh, I had nothing on paper. Everything was done over a handshake. Besides my name on a lease, <laughs> it was like a 40 grand bill every month. Um, so yeah, I was pretty screwed. Um, I got pushed out of the business, um, and that's where my rock bottom started to um, manifest. I uh, went to Joburg to fetch my kids because um, I'd finally started getting that right. You know, in between everything, my children had always been involved in my life. It was the one thing I actually always maintained was my relationship with them, and I would phone them every day, no matter how out of my mind I was. And I went to fetch them. And I arrived at my mom's house, and they were making a nice poiki for me. My brother made a nice lamb neck poiki, my little one, the one that, it, uh, anyway. Um, and I went to the room, and I was just like, I was like, fuck, I need, I, I, like, I phoned, I knew the guy's number off by heart. I phoned him, I said, Brutus, bring me a box. Uh, I met him down the road. I said to him, I'm going to go buy a cigarette. And I stopped, and I pulled over, and I went to the toilet, and I shot up, and I, got in my car and I started driving back to the house and I was like, no, this is not working. Uh, turn around, back to the bathroom, shut up again. Next minute, I woke up through someone's dining wall nearly in their dining room um, on a Sunday afternoon. I'd passed out driving, um, my own car for a change, um, without insurance because um, it was insured through my company, which... Um, my ex had cancelled my insurance on my car. And I finally felt the pain of crashing a car and having to actually pay for it. Um, and that didn't stop me. Eh? The insanity was, I got home, my parents looked at me in disgust. I rented a car the next day, I drove back to Durban. Uh, when the kids left, I just started again. Eh? I'd phone and they would deliver stuff and it started once or twice a week and then just snowballed. Into, into every single day. And eventually, God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Eh? He, brought, he brought me to my knees. I got blessed with the spirit of desperation. Um, I think the verve sung it best. The drugs don't work. They just make things worse. Um, I would use and go straight up into withdrawal. Um, and I couldn't get to work. And I woke up one Wednesday after morning with my boss sitting at the end of my bed. Um, he had phoned the house on the hill and prearranged everything and told me um, that he 
the, it's a click of a button to pay the deposit and please get to treatment and you know I'm offering you help and uh, I said no I'm fine and uh, he said to me do you have any drugs left uh, and, I, and I had five amps in my pocket I'll never forget and the only thing that got me to say yes was to get him out the room so that I could use it was the only reason why I uh, agreed to go and I said I'll go for a week I just need to get off this needle because that's the problem you know um, I'm, I'm okay, you know, everything else is okay. I can do all these other things. I was fine. Look at, look at me and look how successful I am. And uh, I got to treatment, as Caleb said. I walked into the bathroom there. I used the last time. I came out. I gave him my needles. I don't remember anything else after that. Um, and I woke up a week later after I said I'd go. And I came off my meds. And I listened to someone come in and share on a Saturday morning and he spoke straight to me and he spoke my story and when they told me about this program being a spiritual non-religious one I was like okay I can listen now um, that was the, the biggest things that I just thought I was going back to another no quarter. I thought I was going to go back to like having Jesus beaten into me and given spades and being chained to places and things and, and being told to run up and down a mountain with these things and I was, was that was my, my idea of rehab um, I've seen this NA or an AA thing. Uh, I always thought, you know, there were a bunch of losers sitting around a circle singing Kumbaya. Um, and uh, I, finally, I finally surrendered, you know. I think after a week of being there, I realized that I needed to be there for longer. And I approached Caleb and I, and I was fearful. I just remember being full of fear. My job, this, that, all of the things outside of myself that I thought I would lose. Those morning groups um, with Don, she's um, letting go of everything was probably one of the most difficult things I ever had to do. But the moment I became willing, the moment I said, you know what, I don't care about my car, I don't care about the job, I was prepared to resign, I begged them to please let me stay on and that I would come work here in Scottborough as a hairstylist and live there forever. And and, and cut hair yeah, for five rand a haircut, I don't care, and pay them somehow. Um, I was prepared to never see my children again if that's what my ex was going to do until that I could get well. I just wanted to get well. I saw what you guys had and I saw what everyone in this fellowship had and I wanted it so badly that I was prepared to do anything and go to any lengths. And, um, you know... I surrendered. My boss came to see me. I told him how I was at, where I was at. And he said, you know, I'm 100% behind you. I walked through the fears. I followed suggestions. I listened to absolutely everything that was told to me in treatment. And, and I was willing to stay for as long as they told me to stay. Eventually, they said, I needed, you said I needed long-term treatment. Uh, came December, the house got full. They told me to go home. Um, <laughs> I resented you for that. <laughs> Still just put in my step 11 a few times. Um, but you know, just becoming willing and, and being prepared to let go. Uh, you know, the, the material stuff stayed. Um, becoming willing for me in my experience. I know it's not like that with everyone. You know, my boss made a way. He helped me pay my bills. Um, he was supportive. I was very lucky. Very lucky. The mother of my kids was supportive of my decision. Um, the car place let me pay off and I got honest. I told him, because I was paying this car off that I'd written off months ago, like pretending like I still had it. I got honest. I let them know where I was at. Um, I came in there with nothing, with the clothes on my back um, and a few clothes at my house, um, which I'm renting, so it wasn't my house. And, um, you know, I left, I left there with nothing. But inside... I was, I was full, and I'm full every morning. I get up, and I do what I need to do, and I, and I work this program. Eh? It's not easy. Eh? It's not easy to, to have sat down and gone through my, my step five and have seen all of my parts and everything, to have seen how my mother is sick. You know, she was sick like me. How could I, how dare, what makes me think I'm any better than her, uh, that I can now hold this against her, that, that like, I deserve some special treatment? I became accepting, you know. Um, for me, the gifts and the promises, 
have just not stopped coming. Eh? My mom and I are so close now. We speak nearly every day. Um, my dad and I have become so close. My older brother, who I never spoke to, they fight over me because I've started going to Joburg now for work. Again, God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. I would get on my knees every morning and pray and go, God, please bring my children closer to me. You know, um, and uh, eventually he made a way and a business opportunity came up in Joburg and I got given the opportunity to be two weeks there and two weeks here. And um, I just met someone and just got into a relationship and I got resentful. I was like, fuck, why, why must I go there? You know, like now I must leave. Now, I didn't want to go. Meantime, I've got all these amends that I can make and, and you know, like I just, I, I get in the way all the time and I keep getting in the way. And this is why sponsorship and speaking to a sponsor and being honest and making yourself vulnerable is so important because for me at least, for, because uh, without it, I'd be, I'd be nowhere. You know, with Nick's will, Yes, you guys heard. Um, it's mad. Um, it's absolute madness. Um, I never thought I could get a day, through a day without using some sort of substance. Um, and now I can't think of a day where I actually feel this much desire to use. Um, God's freed me. My higher power has freed me from active addiction and of restoring my relationships with my family, uh, with my children. I'm present. The mother of my kids is coming to recovery because she's seen what's my life, what, what's happened in my life, and, and she wanted it. Um, she hated me. We had been through stuff even now towards the end. I phoned Caleb up a few months ago, and, and he still said, bro, you've been clean five minutes. Get off your high horse. Again, my arrogance, my grandiosity, you know. I feel like I'm, I can be like all this. Where I just humble myself, and I've got to keep working my program and keep doing the next right thing, you know, the 11th tradition says it. This program is best led by example, not by instruction. And uh, God's, God's blessed me enormously. Um, I've got a, a mother who's sober now, looking after my children, going to meetings. My two children who know more about recovery than what I do, they've got Google, and they, they're pretty sharp. Um, and yeah, they've never been to a meeting, but they know about all these things. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, Mom doesn't tell them either. She still thought I told them. And I was like, no, I don't talk to them about that. You know, they know that I'm sober, and that's it. Um, yeah, just blessed beyond words. I mean, I got given an opportunity to get a car. I'm not even going to talk about the material things. I feel that's very irrelevant. For me, uh, the promises are, are, are totally within myself, like being free from, God, from, from, from those groups of addiction and, and, and having my family back, you know, being able to be present and... And do things differently this time, you know. Make it about them and not always make it about me. You know, on my one year, um, I woke up and I was in a bit of a shit space. I had a bit of a, an argument um, with my partner. And I woke up in the morning. I thought I can have this day go one of two ways. I can either go through it hating it or I can actually make it about other people. And I got in my car and I drove from Edenville to Four Ways and I phoned every single person who's either helped me or I've put through hell. And I showed them gratitude and I said how grateful I am for having them in my life. And, and I got to work and I felt free. I don't know how this thing works, but it works, guys. And uh, for all the guys that are new, um, stick around and become willing, you know. Um, it was the only thing that ever got me right, um, just letting go, eh? you know. And we hear it all the time, letting go and letting God. It sounds so easy. Um, but we get in the way, and I get in the way. Um, as soon as I got out of the way, and I, and I became willing, and my life changed, and, I, and I'm grateful, and it's full today. I'm never, I never have to be alone again. Um, being alone was a scary thing in my active. Um, I used to dread it. I'd find anyone and buy anyone, any drugs or any booze, just to like have them with me all the time. And now, I can't wait to get a moment to actually be on my own, and actually have five or ten minutes and try sort of reflect and and connect with my higher power, because that's when I feel I do, you know. For me, it's, I keep it simple, it's nature. I've tried going to church even, coming into recovery. Um, try, I'm open-minded, I'm willing to try new things. Still battle with that, but you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm willing, and I'm present. Um, there's one thing I learned from being on that house on the hill, and that's to become present and to live in the now. Um, it's really changed my life. Um, 
and, and I really recommend it to anyone who's, who's just got into treatment and, and, and is willing to give this a go. Thanks for letting me share.